Welcome, everyone, to the Satellite at Scale presentation. I'm John Henley, Red Hat Solution Architect. Presenting with me today is Darren Lively and Brian Amling, System Engineers at Walmart. The content of this presentation, some of the configuration and parameter settings are specific to Walmart, so please keep in mind they're not necessarily specific to your environment. Everybody's familiar with Walmart. They, they have one of the, the world's most legendary supply chains and the largest retailer. This allows products to get into the distribution centers and into the consumer hands all around the world. We're going to take a look at part of their IT infrastructure today, the people behind it, and the tools they use that make this possible. Walmart's Satellite 6 journey is going to be broken down into five parts today. The first part, we're going to take a look at the Walmart and Red Hat joint engineering. Then we're going to examine Walmart's scale and the reference architecture, and then moving on into the client side of things, and then closing it out with the operational improvements. Walmart and Red Hat have been working together for many, many, many years on lifecycle management within their environment. Walmart was a Satellite 5 user starting in 2014, and in 2016, Walmart's business demands had outgrown the capabilities of Satellite 5. Satellite 6 provided more capabilities around lifecycle management, automation, provisioning, and scale to meet their current IT environment requirements today and as well as in the future. <clears throat> Walmart and Red Hat started to collaborate in 2016 to try to decide when was the right time for Walmart to migrate to Satellite 6. We all agreed that Satellite 6.2 would be the starting point. We also wanted to build a process that was standardized and also was usable by all. <clears throat> we also wanted to build something that was we could build, deploy, and manage a Satellite 6 infrastructure that could manage 60,000 plus hosts in a global environment. We accomplished that challenge through joint engineering. Today, we are going to take a look at Walmart's Satellite 6 journey by examining what is Walmart scale. I present to you Darren Lively. So, everybody hear me all right? Hear me all right in the back? Okay. So um, we are going to get into some details here in a few minutes, but we really wanted to start out by talking about what really drives the scale. So Walmart, when you think about Walmart, you probably think about our stores, right? But we also operate a lot of distribution centers and a large e-commerce website. And we employ 2.3 million people in 28 countries. So we have a very large business, and that requires a very large infrastructure. So what we wanted to talk about today was how we manage that infrastructure with satellite. So this is what that scale looks like. If this is going to go. This is what that scale looks like from a satellite perspective. So <clears throat> we're managing right around 60,000 Linux clients. Um, all of those are broken up into multiple business units with their own business needs. So we have several different lifecycle environments for like DevCert and Prod, and also quite a few content views. And when you take those together, it ends up being nearly 4,000 YUM repositories in Pulp, which is a lot. Um, in those repositories, we've synced in over 230,000 RPM packages, and we're able to serve out over 180,000 packages per hour. <clears throat> and we do all of this with one satellite server and 22 capsule servers. And we keep track of a lot of these numbers uh, through dashboards in Grafana, like this one. So this is what we see every day when we come into the office. Um, you'll notice that we've got Puppet on the left and Satellite on the right. So this is where I want to emphasize to everybody that we are not serving any Puppet content through Satellite. We have an entirely separate Puppet infrastructure just for that. Uh, but you can see uh, from the satellite side, we can keep track of how many builds are happening, 
how many registrations are happening, because those are, those are different things for us, um, and how many packages are being downloaded at any time. <clears throat> so at this point, uh, we kind of know what the scale looks like, and I'm going to start getting into some of the specifics, some of the technical details. I'm going to go a little bit fast, but you can refer back to the slides a little bit later. So we worked with Red Hat, and we came up with a design that looks something like this. <clears throat> and at first glance, admittedly, this probably looks a little complex for satellite, but it's really not that bad once you start to walk through it. So in the upper left here, we have our content sources. So these are things like the Red Hat CDN, the SUS CDN, other various third-party repositories. And then we also have our internal repos for packages that have been built in-house. And all of those come in through various corporate proxies and firewalls, in through a squid proxy, and into the satellite server itself, which is really the center of everything, right? <clears throat> so this is where your users access the system. This is where API calls terminate. This is where you install plugins like form and templates, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And this is where a lot of the metrics collection happens. And you'll notice here that we have the database broken out separately. Um, this is a future state. This is where we want to get to with the external database, which is coming up in the near future, Brent. Yeah, 6-4? OK, cool. Um, so next up, we have our capsule servers. Um, and even though we do have a lot of edge compute in our stores and our distribution centers, we talked to our networking team, and it really made sense to still bring all that traffic back to the data center. So we have the majority of these, 18 of them, are set up in a special configuration behind a load balancer and with a shared file system. <clears throat> and we'll go into a little bit of the details on the shared file system later on when we talk about publishing. And this is really what enables the horizontal scaling uh, for all of our clients. Um, in addition to those 18, we do have a few special purpose capsules. We have some for various secure environments. And uh, we have one where it actually it did make sense to put a capsule closer to the endpoints in country. And then we also have one capsule designated just for uh, provisioning. So it's running like TFTP and Pixie. Uh, next up, we have a lot of the communication that happens between the clients and the capsules, and I'm not going to go through all of that, but the really important thing here is the load balancer. So again, this is what helps enable uh, that horizontal scaling, and it even gives us a little bit of, of HA capabilities because we can lose one or two, five capsules and not really be impacted too bad. Uh, but the other really important thing about this is that it lets us configure all of our clients to point to the same VIP. And then the, the load balancer can just figure out where to direct that traffic to the various capsules. <clears throat> and then lastly, we have our Linux clients. So you can see, again, these are all broken up into the various business units. And this is something that it's very important to be able to configure and automate, which is what Brian's going to talk about in just a few more minutes. So at this point, we have the infrastructure taken care of, but still has to be configured, right? <clears throat> so out of the box, we knew that the, the default configurations weren't <coughs> going to scale to what we need. So we took our experiences scaling Satellite 5, plus our experiences with our Puppet infrastructure. We worked with the satellite engineering team and the performance team, and we came up with a lot of the values that, that we're going to talk about today. <coughs> so first up is the custom hire file. This isn't actually a component of, it's not a configuration for any component. But it's still very important because this is how you tell the installer to honor your configurations. So if you don't know, when you run the satellite installer, it does a local Puppet apply. And the way Puppet works is if you go and you make a change to something that Puppet cares about, and then you run Puppet, it's going to undo your changes. So this is how we tell the installer to leave your stuff alone. Um, <clears throat> one of the examples we wanted to talk about, that very first line, uh, the Apache purge configs. So if you're going to drop a custom <coughs> configuration file in the Apache conf.d directory, which we do, without this in place, the next time you run the installer, it's going to purge that file, and you'll have to put that back in place manually, and you don't want that. <clears throat> so now we can actually get into some of the Apache overrides. So this is that file that we drop in the conf.d directory. 
And a lot of these values uh, you can pull out of the performance tuning guide, which was just updated recently. It's, it's very good. Uh, so I'm not going to go through all of those, but one of the really important ones for us was that top value for passenger max pool size. So this is something that early on, we did a lot of tweaking and a lot of changing of some of these values, um, especially during the registration period for clients because it was a very busy time. Um, and the reason this is so important is because if you set this value, well, first of all, let me, let me tell you what that is. So what passenger max pool size does is it determines how many client requests you can handle at any given time. And that includes both users in the UI and your clients checking in and any kind of API calls. <clears throat> so if you set this too low and you get a big burst, then your users and your clients are going to get 500 to 503 errors. If you set it too high and you get a big burst, you're going to run your server out of memory, which we did um, quite a few times. Um, so you, you'll want to kind of play around with this, find the sweet spot of, of what you need here. Uh, next up, we have the limits files. These, you know, nothing too crazy here. You really just want to make sure that each of these services has enough open file handles to, to deal with your scale. Uh, and then we get into the kernel tunables. So <clears throat> a couple of the really important ones here, vm.swappiness. This is something that I mentioned, you know, we had, we had some, some issues with memory early on, and so much so that we were exhausting all of our memory and dipping into swap. And as soon as you start dipping into swap, then your performance really hits pretty hard. So this was a way for us to tell the kernel to kind of pull back on that, use the minimal amount of swapping, but it's still there just in case you need it. And then also the way, um, <clears throat> the, the way that you're handling dirty pages. Uh, so this is something that we learned back in our satellite five days um, with, some, with a, a really high transactional, uh, highly busy database like Postgres <clears throat> on, on a scaled satellite, you really don't want to build up a lot of changes in memory, hoping to be able to write those to disk whenever you get some downtime, and then you never actually get that downtime. So what this does, it kind of just allows the kernel to, to be a little bit more consistent and, and start writing those changes, flushing those changes out of memory and to the disk on, on a more consistent basis. Next up, we actually get into some of the Postgres configs. Uh, there's a lot of information out there on how to tune Postgres. Um, the, the important stuff here, you want to make sure you have enough connections to handle what, what your scale is going to be. The most we ever really see is about 600, so 1,000 works well for us. Um, and then you also just want to make sure you give it enough memory to do its work. Uh, but the really important one that I wanted to point out here was that bottom line, the log minimum duration statement. <clears throat> so what that does is every time that a query to Postgres takes longer than 500 milliseconds, it's going to write that query to the log file. So that's not a performance gain, but it is really helpful to the satellite engineers and to the support cases if when you're having an issue with slowness, if you start seeing a lot of these long queries, you can pass that information back up to the engineers. They can track it back to the code and hopefully you know, determine the problem, maybe make some improvements if, if necessary. And the other nice thing about this, since this is being logged, we can actually collect a lot of the metrics and we can graph what th this looks like over time and which events are causing some of these longer queries. Next up, we have log rotate. Um, so this was something that was a really reactive change for us. So if you've ever taken a look at the Foreman production log, you know it gets really, really chatty. And if you add 60,000 clients to that, it just becomes completely unreasonable. Uh, so the default uh, time, the, the default log rotate rules were one week on these, which wasn't nearly aggressive enough for us. So we put a few extra rules in. So we're rotating foreman off every hour, and we're rotating Apache off every day. <clears throat> and the very last config I was going to talk about is pulp concurrency. Uh, so this we put in to kind of help with some of our publish times. Uh, by default, this is set to eight, eight pulp workers. And we doubled that up to 16 to just try and get a little bit more work done in the same amount of time. So at this point, that covers the satellite infrastructure side, but that's really only one part of the equation. So Brian is now going to talk about how to automate and handle the client side. Thanks, sir. Yep. Can you hear me? <laughs> uh, 
So let's talk about uh, the satellite client at scale. Uh, as we've discussed already before, we were a Satellite 5 customer going into this effort, and we were already a, a puppet managed environment. And we were uh, managing that Satellite 5 client code with that puppet, so it wasn't really a large stretch for us to imagine that we were going to go do this effort to migrate to Satellite 6 with Puppet. And so the first step that we, we took into that was breaking apart the client installation. So if you've, any, if you've ever looked at the, the bootstrap, <coughs> you, you know that it's basically managing files. It's managing which packages are installed. It's managing which services are started. And that lines up really well with what we did in Puppet. So we took that code and we, we started working on a process to break it up because two of us could not manage 60,000 client installs in a reasonable amount of time, and we were tr gonna try and do it in two months. So uh, once we started that breakdown process, we, we moved it into uh, a testing phase where we wanted to make it basically a bulletproof process. If it was a brand new uh, client, it, would, it needed to be registered. If it was a broken client, it needed to be fixed and re-registered. If there was anything wrong with, uh, say, a support issue and someone removed a package or they changed a file, then it needed to fix that and needed to put it back and re-register it. So that process became a very solid, stable system, and we moved on to the next challenge, which was how do we manage to roll this client out to 60,000 nodes without breaking everybody and figuring out, uh, you know, what we're going to do as far as uh, two people trying to get this done. So. Again, we're a Puppet Enterprise client. Uh, we have this large rollout system. We, we have business units. So we took the idea that we're going to break these clients into business units and logically group them into uh, classifications. That, that ended us up into about five to 500 to 1,000 clients a group. And so we added some more client code to the Puppet system to enable and disable turning on those, those groups uh, independently. So classification groups worked out really well for us. We were able to actually start small and test and dev and work our way up into uh, the production environment at a very uh, leisurely or aggressive pace depending on what we wanted to do. So let's talk about uh, our client base. We are not a rail only shop, surprise. It might have been mentioned, you might have picked it up earlier, but we do run uh, SLES as well. And uh, or when we started this, this journey at the time, Satellite 6 did not have a supported client uh, for SLES. So we decided to go to the upstream source and compile and use it in our environment. And we had some success early on, but we, we quickly realized it wasn't going to work out for us. So we worked with our Red Hat colleagues and we created a support exception and we started uh, to pull down the actual RHEL client source and compile it in our own environment. And that was helpful in, in a couple of different ways. One, it allowed us to uh, keep the client level stable and we were actually rolling the same client uh, code version to all of our, our uh, hosts in the environment. And that, that helped us from a support perspective and from a, a management perspective inside of Puppet as well. So um, as we started to move that, that process, we had to make a couple of changes in satellite as well to recognize that SLES was an actual client that's being registered to the satellite. So how, how does scale impact the client rollout? Um, so basically, the, the standard uh, setup of the client is not something that worked well in our scale at the time. Um, the clients started registering as we, as we registered them into the satellite. The daemon started checking in. Um, we have Puppet run every two hours, so we were getting registrations. If there were any issues with any box, it was trying to re-register. We were having uh, profile uh, updates, we were having host profile updates, we were having package profile updates, we were having daemons check in. All of this was starting to culminate as uh, Darren mentioned a minute ago, we were getting memory exhaustions, we were running out of passengers, we were seeing a lot of impact to our environment as we were creating this rollout. So we have some operational improvements that we wouldn't want to talk about as we move along this, this journey. So we're Walmart, we're scale, we're used to adapting and, and moving on. We, we overcome these issues and, and work with our vendors to make it better. So this is a pretty good representation of our rollout as, uh, as time progressed. We, we started in January of last year 
and we wanted to be uh, mostly done within about two months. And so uh, we, we had this bulletproof uh, client registration process. We had Puppet managing it. We had the ability to roll it out into groups. So we started in test and dev and tried to figure out how this was going to work. We were getting some really good results. We were seeing positive registrations and not a lot of uh, negative results from the issue. So we decided to, to ramp it up. And as you can see, somewhere around January 8th or 9th, uh, we, we really got aggressive. We had a lot of confidence going into this process, and we were feeling pretty good about it. But what happened, um, the more registered uh, clients we got into the satellite, the worse it became. And uh, we, we crashed it a lot, multiple times a day. <laughs> And we, we basically had to take a step back and figure out what are we going to do, how are we going to fix this. And uh, as Darren mentioned, we use Grafana. And so we started looking for the peaks, and we started to figure out where is the client talking too much, where is the satellite having problems. And so as we took that step back, we, we tried to figure out what's going on, how do we make changes, and where do we make improvements. And you can see that we did overcome. Uh, it took us a couple of days, maybe a week, at tops, but we were able to take those business units and drive through to the end, uh, but we did crash it a lot. So these, you can see these Grafana reports. These are, uh, these are passenger processes that we see. So as, as Darren mentioned, anytime somebody's in the UI, anytime it's an API, anytime a box is registering, the, the satellite's going to get uh, some kind of a contact. So what happened was uh, we, we took those daemons and we turned them into cron jobs. And with Puppet already running in our environment, it only took two hours to make these changes to our environment. So we were able to make tweaks to the passenger numbers. We were able to make changes to the, to the cron jobs uh, within a relative, uh, a quick turnaround. And so we were able to see impact change pretty quickly. So what we did is we took those daemons, we turned them into cron jobs, uh, and we used a process Puppet provides called FQDN RAND. And as you can see, those peaks and valleys every four hours turn into a nice flat line. And so that really helped us push through to the next level of finding what the next issue was in our environment and how we could optimize that as well. And Darren is going to talk to you about what we did for publishing and, and to make it better. OK, so uh, one, of the, one of the challenges that we had, one of the requirements that we had is to be able to provide new content to our users in a reasonable amount of time. And doing this is different in SAT 6 than it was in SAT 5, right? So in SAT 6, you have content views that have to be published and promoted. So early on, we thought, OK, we'll try and do this through the UI. And that was awful. So um, really awful. <laughs> <laughs> like, like that bar should be through the roof, probably, because we, we just couldn't get all of our content views done in a single day. Like, and we were spending time on the keyboard all day with it. It was a lot of clicking, a lot of, a lot of going around and, and just waiting. And we know that's, there's going to be some fixes to that coming soon. Uh, they, we have some really good people working on that now. Um, but at this point, we realized, you know, this isn't something we can spend all day every day doing. So obviously, we scripted it, right? We started using the API. So we wrote a script to do everything we were trying to do. And that helped because it took us off of the keyboard. It made it uh, kind of a hands-off thing. But it was still taking more than 24 hours to get finished, which is a little too long for a daily process. So at this point, we were starting to look at what was taking so long. And we found out what was happening was every time we published or promoted a content view, and remember, we have a lot of those, it kicks off a capsule sync, and we have 18 capsules. So we were spending all of this time just churning and, and doing all of this extra work and not really getting a lot of things done. So at this point, you know, things were not working. So we got with Red Hat and we said, you know, let's, let's figure something out. We, we worked together and we came up with a, a customized solution which included a shared file system. So that shared file system, it's read-write on the satellite server and it's read-only on all the capsule servers. And this was great because it immediately eliminated that capsule sync issue, right? So as soon as a publish was finished, it was immediately available to all the capsules. And in addition to that, we also had all of our clients were guaranteed to be getting the same content no matter which capsule they hit through the load balancer, which wasn't a guarantee before because the timing was so off. And so just putting this in place, that brought us down to about 12 hours for a publish 
which was a massive improvement, but it, it still wasn't quite where we wanted to be. So at this point, we went back and we looked at our script again. We had a lot better understanding about the whole process at this point, and we realized that our initial script was doing these publishes one by one sequentially in order, and it really didn't have to. So we knew we could, do, we could add some parallelization in that, so we multi-threaded that script, and we got the whole process down to about four hours. And that was, that was much, much better. Um, and <clears throat> for us, that was acceptable, so we really stayed at that point throughout the rest of 6.2. And then when 6.3 came out uh, a few months ago, it included uh, some really nice improvements to publishing that brought that job further down to about an hour and a half. <clears throat> so you can see over the course of a year a massive improvement in, in publishing time. So this has been great for us. Next up, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the provisioning template development process. So moving, again, moving from SAT5 to SAT6, things are a little bit different. And when we, when we moved to SAT6, we had multiple different users from multiple different teams needing to work on their provisioning templates. And they were a lot of times working on the same ones at the same time. And that was causing problems because they were conflicting with each other or overriding each other's changes, or in some cases, you know, just introducing syntax uh, or, or typo errors into the templates because they're working in the UI. So we really wanted to find a better solution to this, and we knew we had a really good development workflow for our Puppet code, and we wanted something similar to that for our satellite code. So at Summit, we met up with some of the, the satellite engineers and we explained this problem and they said, yeah, well, there's this plugin upstream called Foreman Templates and it does kind of exactly what you're wanting. It takes your templates out of a Git repository and it syncs them into satellite. So as soon as we got back from Summit, we, we got this implemented and it's been great because you know, this solves those problems of people stomping on each other and it also allows us to kind of inject a little bit of automated testing and, and a little tiny CI CD pipeline because we can run tests against the templates before they're synced into satellite to ensure they don't have those typos. <clears throat> and then we can also have development branches going into a lab satellite and then PRs into a master branch which then get synced into the production satellite. So this has been, this has been really useful for us. And the very last thing I'll, I'll talk about is we've, we've mentioned it several times, but the importance of metrics in a system like this. <clears throat> so for us, we use CollectD, Graphite, and Grafana. Um, you know, use whatever makes sense to you, but it's just really important that you have a good idea of what's going on because satellite is a large product with several different components, right? And each one of those components have their own status commands and their own log files, their own configuration files. <clears throat> and if you're only relying on digging through those log files and trying to correlate what's happening, then it's probably going to take you longer than it should. So this is one, one really great way to get around that and kind of speed up your, your time to resolution. Um, just a couple examples. That top one up there, that's how we keep track of our load balance capsules. So those are the Apache Busy servers. And we can keep an eye on that because that should normally, those should all be pretty equal to each other and a pretty low number. So if we see one or two of those start to spike, we know there, there's a problem with one or two capsules. Or what happened once is we saw all of them start to drift upwards. <clears throat> and that indicated to us there's some network congestion somewhere. We were able to track that back and we, we were seeing that those downloads were taking a really long time. They were holding the servers open longer, which was causing more servers to spin up. So it got us to, to the actual root cause of that issue much faster than it might have otherwise. <clears throat> and then the, the middle panel we put in there kind of just to emphasize the importance of having a baseline. So I know that's probably a little hard to see, but what that panel is representing is the number of access requests coming in to the Foreman SSL Apache log. And if you can see, we're getting about 1,500 requests per minute. And that sounds like a lot, right? And if you're having some kind of issue and you don't have this and you only have your logs to go through, and you see that you're getting 1,500 uh, requests per minute, you may think that's a problem. But if you have some trending data, you can go back and you can look, what was it yesterday? What was it a week ago? What was it last month? And for us, this is very consistent. This is normal. So we know immediately, you know, this isn't the problem. We can go track this down somewhere else. 
And that last panel I just kind of threw up there because it looks neat. Um, that's, that's the pulp workers. So that's, that's the pulp workers spinning up, filling up their queues, and then dropping off. Um, so again, emphasize metrics, very important. Get some introspection into your environment. And that's all I had, so I'm going to turn it back over to John. Thank you, Darren. So as we've heard today, Walmart's satellite journey is kind of broken into four parts. The collaboration and sharing of ideas helped to optimize the design planning and the deployment planning. This allowed Walmart and Red Hat to design a reference architecture that would scale to meet their environmental requirements. <clears throat> In turn, this allowed Walmart to success successfully migrate from Satellite 5 to Satellite 6 in a short time frame to meet their business demands. This is, just, this is not just a Walmart satellite journey. This can be your journey as well, because anyone can do this. Thank you, everybody. And we have...